All right, so you're in this prison now. You're single. Things are going okay in that cell. What were the first problems you encountered? Um, uh, I started falling out a little bit with the boss uh, of that wing because yeah. he was a bit of a dick. Or Leia, he's dead now as well. <laughs> was, that, so, was that a natural death? No, he got killed, shot. Is that later on in your story? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that actually because he got released and shot like the second day out of the prison. Oh, wow. Because he just pissed so many people off and, yeah. and, and tortured that many people in the prison. He was just a little shit. Um, so to appease him, I, I decided to buy a cell and I wanted to buy a cell anyway. Yeah. But down in Guayaquil, it was a little bit different. Whereas in Quito, if you bought a cell, you could you you would retain it and you could sell it mm-hmm. there. When you when it came time to leave, it reverted back to the gang. And the gang sold the cells. I see. So I bought a cell for like a grand and a half, which was pretty much empty. Yeah. Uh, didn't need much stuff. Just kid out with some furniture and TV and mm-hmm. aircon unit and whatnot. Um, uh, yeah, so that kind of shut him up. So that money's gone. You're not going to get that cell yeah, back. exactly. The previous cell then, did you get your money back for that one? No, lost all that money in Quito because I own four cells. Lost in the transfer, lost oh. about, again, about 20 grand, 25 no. grand. Because I... Do you need to stop? So we keep going. We've got three cameras, but oh, right. one, just yeah. went da- uh, one just went down. Yeah, lost that money because... I basically uh, tried to get an English guy to sell the cells for me up there. Yeah. He sold them, used the money to get himself out of prison. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Raymond, <laughs> if you're listening, hopefully not. I think he's dead now. But <laughs> or sneak, yeah, from London as well. Yeah, little shit. <laughs> um, so yeah. Couldn't really do any business in the prison in Guayaquil because it was all controlled by the gang and they wouldn't allow foreigners to do anything. So you can't get your hustle on? No, I did eventually. Uh, it just took a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this cell that you moved into, what was that like? Um, it's fairly basic. I mean, you didn't really need much there because it, it was a lot warmer than Quito. So, you know, uh, I was living on my own. Paid the gang, said, look, I want to live on my own. Don't want anyone living with me. It's much better. No hassle, do what you want then. Um, quite a bit bigger than the ones in Quito. It was a big window. I think I, I think the cells were probably built for like four people, probably originally. Uh, but there was a big open window, just raw iron bars, uh, looking out onto an exercise yard. Uh, built a mezzanine level. So like I had a bed at a mezzanine level, a dining area downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, TV, whatnot, stuff like that. How are you getting your food in? There, um, basically got a hold. I think one of the other prisoners introduced me to a woman there who worked for a church, and she would she would bring in shopping for you, money. So I'd have money transferred to her. her name was Mercedes. So I still have very good friends with her. Uh, so yeah, you have your Western Union transfer to her. Tell her what you wanted in the way of shopping. She'd bring in four or five bags of shopping every week. Wow, did they rom- live pretty well? Did the romance blossom with her, or did <coughs> you take? Oh advantage? no, no, no! She was like a older person, like a I second see. mother to me. Did you take advantage of the conjugal visit system? Um, in Guayaquil, it wasn't really. It was a bit different to Quito. They didn't have mm. that thing where you yeah. where your girlfriend could stay over every night, oh. uh, every other uh, week. Sorry, yeah, on a Saturday. Um, cat hair flowing in front of my face <laughs> um, but uh, a girl from Manchester that I've met in Quito and uh, become very friendly with she came back to Ecuador I can't remember why I think she was in the Caribbean but flew down to Ecuador to see me anyway and stayed uh, for a few nights in the prison with me which is really cool that is absolutely cool there's two things people look forward to the most in prison <laughs> two, two of the things are visits and mail it's like gold so if you've got people out there in prison around the world, at least drop them a letter. Yeah. It's the highlight of the day, isn't it? What, yeah, yeah. What was, how did they do mail call out there? There was no mail call. <laughs> so we didn't have that option either. Really? I mean, you could have letters sent, but they would have to go via the embassy. Yeah. And by that point, the embassy were only coming in once every six months. Okay. So, it, yeah, mail was a... The prison had no mail system. So if the embassy bring it in, is it protected under the umbrella of legal mail then, perhaps? Diplomatic mail? Mm, I think they... Mm, I think they did use to open it, if I can remember correctly. The embassy opened it, or the prison? Yeah, the embassy, and then the prison, probably. Okay, so there were the security checks. I can't actually remember. Yeah. 
Not sure. All right, so what challenges started to arise then in this new cell? Um, uh, well, it was going kind of okay. And then this other gang, the Troneros that I mentioned just now, this was their sort of uh, christening into the Ecuadorian prison system, I suppose. At that point, they weren't huge. But they uh, about 15 of them came into the prison and into the wing that I was on including their 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 boss and his brother who i became very friendly with quite different to the people that were already running the prison the gang that were running the prison at the time the cubanos were kind of more like street thugs and more street level crime whereas the chorneros when they came in they were more contract killing slightly better educated easier to get on with and yeah i got with them quite well actually <laughs> um but it created tension on the wing because the Cubanos thought that these guys were going to take over the prison, which they were starting to very quickly, actually, because they were a lot heavier, a lot stronger. So they hatched a plot to kill them, brought in a, a group of guys, about 10 or 15 of them, brought them into the wing, killers. And one night in October, about nine 9.30 at night, I'm cooking some food in the cell with a German friend, another Peter. And um, we started to sense that something was wrong on the wing. We could see little groups of people like having hushed conversations and weird movements and not many people out on the wing. Bearing in mind the cell doors that were open 24 hours a day there. Never locked out. Uh, unless you lock yourself in the cell. That yeah. is. So I... Um, the... Uh, trying to work it out one of the gang members from the Chorneros who was living next door to the boss of that gang asked me for a plate of food I said okay no problem uh, when I got the plate came back to start you know I'm cooking the food get it ready spaghetti bolognese and I take it down to him as I take it down to him there's another group from the Cubanos waiting at the entrance to the, to the wing you know ready to kick off and I, I wasn't really aware of all this. So I knock on the guy's door and they use this as an excuse to start the gunfight. One of them comes up behind me and over my right shoulder shoots the guy that I've given the plate of food to straight in the face. Deafens me. And I'm just like, what the fuck? And I'm running back to myself. I mean, the guy's, you know, yeah, he's fucked, dead. I run back to myself, dive through the door, slam the door shut. The German guy proceeds to open the door again, sticks his head out to see what's going on. I'm like, Peter, what the fuck are you doing? Pull him back in, and that starts a two-hour-long gun battle on the wing between these two rival gangs. Two or three people end up dead. Ten or eleven injured. Hand grenades going off. And the police... Hand grenades they, going off. Yeah, hand grenades. And Uzi got discharged. You know... Yeah, it was scary because at, by that point as well, I had ended up getting in with these the Chonaras and they'd put me in charge of selling the coke for them. <sighs> this is probably about two years into me being there. So four years into the sentence. Um, so having that association with them has put, has, has put a target on my back a bit. So I'm expecting the door to come through any time now and someone to shoot me as well. Because I'm literally living in front of the boss's... The, the, the cell in front of me is where the boss's brother's living. And I'm shouting to him whilst all this is going on. Carlos, are you right? And he's shooting out the top of his door. And there's bullets bouncing off the ricocheting off the walls. And oh, it was horrific. When it was all over, the police came in. After two hours of all this mayhem. The police came in. And started started again torturing everybody got us all out all on the ground lying you know face down on the on the on the concrete floor just beating the hell out of everybody to find out what had gone on taking people in cells discharging m16s up against their heads drowning them electrocuting them i mean it's just people screaming and crying all these tough gang leaders are a bit you know as soon as the police come in they're in tears crying getting beaten half killed Kill so that goes on for another well. two hours so this is four hours of a sheer terror now. <clears throat> and at the end, after the police move out, the, the prison guards get us all together and they'd ex they basically executed one of the gang leaders in 
the the exit way to the to to the exercise yard was the width of a cell. <laughs> So they got one of the gang leaders in there, and they'd execute him. They, they they shot him twice in the stomach, and during the during the gunfight, we could hear him crying out for his family, and please saying, "Please don't shoot me! I've got family." And, and the other guys going, "We've got your fucking leader. We're going to kill him now." And then after half an hour, the guy pleading not to be killed, they just went, "Fuck this! You know what? We're going to kill this guy." Just shot him in the head a couple of times, and that was that. But the amount of blood, the guy was quite big. The amount of blood covered about half the air. See, the width of the cell is like from here to here. It yeah. covered half of that. And they heard it, 130 of us into this space. So, you know, from here to the end of the studio. 130 people crammed into there standing in this guy's blood as a, as a lesson. And then whipped us with a cat and nine tails coming out of there. <sighs> Soaked a pair of my trainers in the guy's blood, which I had to throw away. Like literally that, <sighs> that deep in blood. And the smell... That's what you don't forget. The smell of the blood, the iron oxidizing. It's just ugh, it's that sweet, sickly, blah, not nice. <laughs> that was just one incident. This, that was one of the bad ones. But This is, I told you in the beginning this was going to get going. Crazy town. <laughs> and that's just one incident. And we're at two hours right now. And I think that's a good point to pause it because Peter earlier said he will be willing to come back to do a part two. My voice is a bit yep. hokey with all these live yeah. streams right now. I'm suffering as well. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let us know in the comments if you would like Peter to come back. Let us know in the comments <laughs> questions you may have for him about what's happened so far and what's going to come next. We'll put them to him at the end, David Macmillan style. Urge people to go down in the description box, check out his book. I don't know if he's going to do any socials before we get this up, but we will put those links down there. There's going to be the link to his vice. There's going to be a link to his David Macmillan interview. I think David's almost at 10K subs now, so please go down, subscribe to Macmillan. He's doing brilliant stuff, and he's been on here, you know, 11 episodes, some of them three hours long. He spent so much time with us. He's done 11 episodes. He's it? the most reoccurring guest. Is he? Oh, yeah. I'll try and top him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, huge thank you to all the new subs. Subscription log goes in the bottom right-hand corner. And a huge thank you to people who have gone down in the description box and clicked on our donation links and all our other playlists. UK Gangsters, um, True Crime, Epstein, Royal Family, everything. Hope you have enjoyed this one. Probably still in your lockdown right now if you're in the UK. Yeah. All right, brother, give us a hug. Let's not break the mics. <laughs> Cheers, man. Great. Yeah. Thanks, well done. Cool.